You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. In this week's episode, Father Paul concludes his discussion of Genesis chapter 16, noting the interesting appearance and subsequent itinerary of Be'er Lahai Roi. I am delighted to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. So here we hear that Ishmael is going to live precisely in that area where the law will be handed to the children of Jacob. But soon enough in Joshua chapter 8, we shall hear that the law was read aloud to the children of Jacob and also to the strangers. Okay, I hope my hearers can view the totality of the picture. But again, one has to wait. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. So technically, Ishmael is accepted as the son of Abraham, as Paul pointed out to that in Galatians. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Soon we shall hear that after the institution of the circumcision, it is Abram and Ishmael that are circumcised before the birth of Isaac. Now, let me finish with this interesting series of Be'er Lahai Ro'i. So we have it the first time in Genesis 16.14, which is the text that we heard, but we have it also in two later passages. In 24.62, out of the blue sky, very powerful. Imagine you're listening to scripture and you hear, Be'er lahai ro'i. That's it. And it disappears. And then in Genesis 24, 62, you hear, And now Isaac had come from Be'er lahai ro'i and was dwelling in the Negev. So scripture is squeezing Isaac in the ears of the hearers into the same area that is the area of Ishmael. Negev, remember, is in the south, close to Shur, which is also a wilderness. In other words, the wilderness of shepherdism, ultimately, as I stress time again, is the place where Isaac and Ishmael, if you like, the insider and the insider meet as children of the one Abraham. Remember, Genesis 24 is after the name of Abraham is changed to Abraham. Now again, my hearers are going to say, well, that's your opinion, Father Paul. You would like to play games. Well, I'm not. Because a few verses later, remember this is Genesis 24, 62, where we hear that Isaac had come from Be'er Lahai Ro'i and was dwelling in the Negev. A few verses later in Genesis 25, very strikingly, we hear, after the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac dwelt at Be'er Lahai Ro'i. And that is the prelude of chapter 26, where Isaac 
would stubbornly pursue the peace with the Philistines. It is amazing. So the story of the Bible is against this grain of theology and self-righteousness that we are in the promised land. Zion is not the re-establishment of Jerusalem. It's a new place in the open, in the wilderness. And we have it here. Again, I'm aware that first-time hearers will get the impression that I'm no better than the theologians. You do what we do, Father Paul. I do not think so. I'm just listening to the texts. Three times Be'er Lahai Rohi appears. In these three instances, there is a conjunction with the law, the wilderness of the law, and then the wilderness of the kingdom, which is the same thing Paul has stressed this time and again and again. You keep walking on the way until the Lord comes. Anyway, I mean, it's interesting to bring for the sake of my hearers things together and not keep them hanging. Technically, they should not be listening to me. They should be listening in the car to scripture. But I realize that my teaching and my podcasts are the second best. And I say this very humbly, of course. <laughs> okay, it's the second best because I'm just pointing out matters that my hearers, who in their majority do not know Hebrew, that when later they hear the text, so I'm inviting them to keep listening, but then they have to listen to the text ultimately in Hebrew. And the message is very clear how often I said that. Scripture does not need explication. And I would like to share this. People have noticed that when I got convinced of that for many years already. All my sermons are just explaining the meaning of the original words. And sometimes you don't need to. I mean, the most boring, if not stupid, sermon are the sermons about the parables of the Pharisee and the publican and the parables of the prodigal son, and both of them are in Luke. I mean, to make a sermon on the parables of Luke is so ludicrous. The message is right there. <laughs> but it helps to know the original because one can make connection. And I would like in this regard to give this example where in this parable that is in both Luke and Matthew, in one of them we have what is translated as you should have given the money to the bankers and in the other one put it in the bank. I mean, that's ridiculous. When you hear the word bank, you're going to think that you go to the bank so that God can collect his interest. But if you hear it in the original, and I did the sermon in a Greek church, and the people came to me and thanked me for that, that trapeza is the table, the table where you eat, and also where the table, the tax collector gets his money. But firstly, it is the table where you eat. And thus the connection is very clear. Trapeza is the table of fellowship and trapezite are the deacons who serve that table. In other words, he's telling you, you should have used this money to give it to the others at table fellowship to the lesser one. Remember 1 Corinthians and Romans in chapter 14 at the end of Romans. The weaker brother and the stronger brother to take care of the weakling brother for whom Christ died, as Paul says. That is in the original. 
But then you can play games and do, well, perhaps the author wanted to say that you should really thought of God, give him the advantage to collect some interest. This is a slap in the face of God. He doesn't need the bank and he doesn't need your interest. He feeds you with bread in the wilderness. Anyway, it's an aside, but it's a fitting aside because it shows you how you have to be patient. You hear it once in Matthew, then you have Mark, and you have to wait until Luke to hear the other expression connected to the trapeza. And this is what I tried to do here. This remark that you made about the roi, we have a similar phenomenon in English. If you're at a kid's birthday party and a child is giving a present, he says, this is my present and gives it to the child. And then the child says, oh, this is my present. When it said my present, my can either be the person who's giving it, or it can be the person who's receiving it. So we have this ambiguity in English, and this is ambiguous in Hebrew, whether she is the one seeing or the one being seen. Very much apropos, Richard. That's what the original is doing. One of the things I feel nervous about is when people start talking about seeing God. You made me very nervous about this early on. Sometimes it seems negative when someone talks about seeing God, as in my eye is looking upon God. So how do we understand this in a way that's not too problematic, or is it supposed to be problematic? It's worth talking about that, because seeing in the Bible is the fullness of hearing and knowing something. You remember that expression that God sees what you do. You cannot hide it from him. And that is essentially a function of the judge. Meaning that what you see can be Technically correct, but it is of no value. How many times I said in a court of law, you can see yourself as innocent, but this does not mean that you are innocent because in a court of law, you are asked, how do you plea? But at the end of the case, when the judge emits his judgment, the assumption is that he saw the truth of the matters and he gave his verdict. This is, I'm convinced, what is behind the play as to he who is seeing. And you can apply this to the hearing also. Notice that the name of Yishmael, it is that God or the Lord has heard. Meaning that Hagar, Abram and Sarai are non-functional in the matter. Because ultimately the one who takes care of Ishmael is God, the Lord, in the same way as he does with Isaac and Jacob, who at the end meet in living in the same area, which is the area of Ishmael, who was the first circumcised. And then Isaac joined him in circumcision. Okay. Ishmael was circumcised with Abraham in chapter 17. Isaac is born in chapter 18 and circumcised. This is what I'm convinced is the function on the play. Let me give you a parallel, which I discussed in my commentary on Ezekiel, which is strange. The elders were sitting and they wanted, you see how the English can't grasp that. He says, Darash, they translate to inquire from the Lord. And then the Lord gets angry and say, Ezekiel, 
son of man, will you judge them? I mean, what, what's going on here? They were sitting and they were asking a question, as we would say nowadays. No, because in the original, darash means to study. To look into the matter. And anyone who has attended my classes will remember when you are seated, you are acting as a judge. That's why when you are seated and an elder comes in the Middle East, you must stand. It's not, well, let me expression of respect. You must stand. Because the elder is your judge by definition. So a parallel example, Richard, and you pointed correctly to the one by bringing the English. I would like to go back to scripture and make my hearers hear. I mean, what's going on? Is it Why did God go so upset? Because of the original Darash. They wanted to examine the Lord. You know that in Hebrew and Arabic, the school is madrasat, midrash, midrasha, you know, where you study, you inquire. And it is God who inquires. It is God who sees. It is the ears of the judge that are of the essence beyond the ears of the jury. Because how many times the judge can break the decision of the jury. This is what I'm trying to do in my podcasts more than anything else. The least among them is explaining scripture. It doesn't need explanation. It's very clear. And this is what's happening here. And my hearers will be invited just like you see a strange word. I mean, be'er la I mean, um, just do the concordance. And I'm sure those who know scripture, not who are super intelligent. No, 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 no. Those who know scripture will figure out, if not exactly my conclusion, something parallel. They are on the right track. Why is Be'er Lahai Ro'i in these three passages? And that's what we should do. And, you know, I invite the people to go this way because it's also exciting. I remember a student of mine, but he's my elder, Bishop Vahan Hofhanesian. You know, I need to quote this, although some people will be irked, but that's what he told me. He said, Father Paul, I go to these SBL meetings and it's the same repetition of old stuff. Even the new stuff is boring. At least when I hear you, I get excited. There is something new. There you go. It's worth it just to darash scripture. Examine it, meaning to study it. But the downside that you will discover soon that when you examine scripture, it is God who is examining you. Fantastic. Scripture is the consummate entrapment, if not trap. Anyway, all this, I'm convinced, is important. And we need to repeat it until some people as this gentleman at the occasion of my 75th birthday, he said a nice note saying, well, Father Paul pushed me to start learning Hebrew at 53. That was the greatest gift on my 75th birthday. Forget about all the others. And what is stunning that I don't know who that person is. He is the only one I did not know and I still do not know who he is. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.